Good morning. Welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Director of Social Media for HAR. I see a lot of people tuned in this morning. They're excited to hear from you again. <laughs> if you uh, would all join me in welcoming back to our program, Lawrence Dean with Zonda. Welcome. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Look forward to sharing with the HAR audience what we're seeing in the housing industry. Wonderful. Um, so we have a lot of questions for you this morning, Lawrence, but um, our members, those of you watching, if you have questions about um, anything that we discussed this morning, type those into the comments and we'll be sure to get to them as we go through the program. Um, so if we could start, I, I know this is, I think, your third appearance on our program, um, but if you could start um, just telling us a little bit of, about who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be glad to. Uh, so my name is Lawrence Dean, and I'm the regional director in Houston with a firm called Zonda. Now, Zonda may be a name that you're not familiar with because uh, Zonda uh, was a company called Metro Study for about the last 45 years prior to six months ago. Uh, due to a merger and a, a acquisition of another firm, uh, we rebranded about six months ago. And so uh, those of you that may be familiar with Metro Study and, and what we do and what we've done in, in Houston and other big housing markets for, for many decades. It's all the same, but uh, even better. And so uh, what we do is we go out every 90 days and send an army of field researchers out to count all of the new home starts, new home closings, new and new single family for sale or, or townhomes that are for sale, uh, lot inventory, all of those things. And we track uh, every section of every uh, new home subdivision from kind of cradle to grave its entire life cycle. And that information gets rolled up into a web-based database uh, that most builders, bankers, developers, et cetera, subscribe to their members of. And what I do with the company is I, uh, I'm i really kind of the, the uh, person that goes in and, and gets a, a really deep understanding of what that data is telling us and uh, goes around and, and shares the good news or sometimes the not so good news with all of our member companies as well as uh, as industry friends such as yourselves. Mm -hmm. And wonderful. And we've enjoyed having that relationship with Metro Study and now Zonda because you are able to track data that we simply can't. So we really appreciate getting these updates from you from time to time. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you could just give us a general, how is the real estate market doing as a whole? And I think we got a little bit of an interruption from Lawrence's side there. So we will wait just a uh, second. Oh, there we are. And, and, Lawrence, hey, so, we, so, you cut out for just a moment. Um, so if you could if you could start that again for us. <laughs> it looks like we're having a little Lately. bit of a signal interruption. Uh, we, we, you know, we test and we get on early, but you just never know. Sometimes <laughs> technology is a little more fun than we want it to be. Um, but yeah, if you Absolutely. could just start that again for us. Sorry. No, no problem at all. Yes. So, uh, you know, the real estate market uh, across different uh, product type of uh, the Houston region overall is doing very well. Now, while we focus on the new for sale housing component of it, which is uh, uh, going just great guns, most other sectors are doing well. Uh, you all know better than I is doing extremely well due to phenomenally low uh, interest rates on mortgages and a lot of interest in moving your current housing been spending much more time at our homes as you can tell i am right now from what's behind me yeah absolutely um and we do want to talk a little bit about that today and how it can affect the housing market um but just out of curiosity how does houston's market compare to other cities because you track cities beyond houston as well or your company does absolutely uh yes so we track the new home particularly in I guess it's about 40 of the largest metro areas largest new home housing markets around the country and uh, and this has been the case most of the last I'd say in terms of annual new home starts volume uh, so how many new homes are getting built uh, and that's a direct reflection of actual demand for new homes in terms of annual new home starts volume Houston remains the market in the entire country. Uh, in calendar year 2020, we saw 36,739, I think the number was, new home starts. So, you know, really the better part of 40,000 new home starts in Houston. 
Only Dallas Fort Worth exceeds that. Dallas Fort Worth uh, has is typically the number one volume market and has been probably most of the last four years as well. And they saw forty two to forty three thousand uh, new home uh, starts. That said, uh, all four of the major Texas metros, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and San Antonio, are within the top, I guess, 15 uh, cities in terms of annual new home starts. And all of them, kind of probably unsurprising to anybody on this call, saw double-digit year-over-year starts growth in 2020 versus 2019. Okay, great. Well, you know, this is Houston. We never like to lose to Dallas when it, when it no. comes to anything, but... But we'll take the numbers. That's okay. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, apartment. I know. I know you guys don't look too too deep into apartments. But is there any um, data as far that you could give us as far as part, part? Excuse me. As far as the apartment market is concerned. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so, Christina, you're right. Uh, Zonda uh, Metro study. We don't really track uh, the apartment industry, but we do have industry funds that do. So, shout out to Bruce McClenney at Apartment Data Services. I've got some of his summary uh, statistics, and and what we've seen from his data is uh, something kind of interesting throughout the pandemic period, which I would kind of define as starting around May of 2020 through the present. We've seen a very consistent market-wide occupancy rate of apartments between 88 and 89 percent. That's a little suboptimal, but not all things considered that bad. In an ideal perfect world, I think the apartment owners would like to see 92, 93, 94 percent. And prior to the pandemic uh, beginning and and the job losses and such that came with that, uh, we were hovering closer to 90, 91 percent. So it is down but it's not uh, down as appreciably as, as one might expect. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's get into your bread and butter a little bit. So new home market, how is mm-hmm. Houston's new home market doing and how does it compare to other Texas cities? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, comparing Houston really with Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin and San Antonio, Ours is, you know, again, the, the second highest volume one, but in terms of you know, just how hot is it? Well, is it more of a steady, more sustainable rate of growth? Mm-hmm. Overall, uh, Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth uh, have experienced kind of on a percentage basis in 2020 versus 2019, and even the first 90 days or so of 2021 versus 2020, a more measured uh, growth in terms of uh, demand for new homes. Both uh, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, and Houston are hovering around a 20 to 22 percent year over year starts uh, rate increase. Uh, this is more sustainable. Uh, what we're seeing in Austin is just tremendous. Well, it, Austin's a smaller market. Uh, mm-hmm. We're talking you know, 15 to 18,000 new home starts a year. But it, we're seeing just tremendous growth in. Uh, demand for new homes and starts of, of new homes due to Tesla and so many other uh, uh, kind of tech oriented relocations and, and just how overall uh, popular kind of on the national stage mm-hmm. Austin is. And then San Antonio, we're seeing really, really strong, you know, kind of much stronger than normal growth there as well as many of the builders in that market have pivoted aggressively towards more affordable product and that really aligns very well with what the income levels and demand uh, base is in san antonio so austin and san antonio growing faster than us uh, Mm -hmm. but that's maybe okay because ours is more of a steady sustained growth and i would say uh, recently dallas fort worth is probably in the same boat we are Okay. Steady and sustained is usually a good thing to hear. You don't want to go too quickly. We do have a couple questions coming in. Um, Trish said, thoughts on the new construction price increases due to lack of uh, supplies or an increased cost in supplies. Do you believe that will level out? Yeah, that is the that is probably the biggest issue in the housing arena uh, presently uh, in Houston and, and nationally. Uh, you know, I don't pretend to know when lumber prices will revert back to uh, more historic rates. You know, the, the feedback I received from builders is that the price of a frame pack, so the lumber that goes into building a new home, has increased something on the magnitude of 60% uh, since the kind of the pandemic period began. Uh, and, and it's not just that. And it's also uh, not just price increases. It's also availability challenges. And so, uh, you know, when will that all level out? Uh, I would hope that uh, later in, on this year and into uh, 2022, it should begin 
to level out, uh, but there's there's little immediate relief in sight. And that's a that's a constant concern on the part of my builder clients because as a result, and as you all know, representing uh, buyers, they've had to raise prices appreciably just to cover those cost increases and our extremely low interest rates that we've been enjoying have, have kind of had a masking effect on that. Mm -hmm. But as interest rates incrementally tip, uh, tick up, when will we reach that inflection point when they no longer uh, are able to offer quite that level of masking? Okay. I mean, we knew that the the prices of the supplies have gone up, but 60% increase. That is, and I see there was Trish who asked the question, even said in the comments, 60%. That's a that's a startling number. Um, there was also a comment um, from Carmelita. She said, we need to get affordable products in Houston. And, um, you know, I did have a question for you when it comes to that with the housing shortage and the city of Houston pushing for more affordable housing. Do you expect to see more multifamily development? So, uh, yes, multifamily development is definitely one of the tools in the toolbox to mm -hmm. supplying uh, the, the badly needed affordable housing, and, and you're exactly right. That's something that's needed uh, across the Houston area, and, and you know, not just in Houston, but definitely here. Uh, multifamily housing, due to uh, the density, the number of homes that you can uh, squeeze onto one acre of land, theoretically, is definitely a tool that uh, can be used uh, to produce uh, badly needed affordable housing. But we're also seeing other tools in the toolbox in the Houston area. There's a uh, builder ASGI up in the Conroe area that is able to build new homes, uh, more modest in size, uh, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 square feet, uh, but down in the you know, sub 125, 130, 140 price range, and certainly uh, it is not presently. All builders, both single family builders, folks that I work with a lot, and then more globally speaking, yeah, just those who produce new housing, whether it's apartments, single family. Uh, Sorry, our connection um, with Lawrence seems to be going in and out a little bit, but he did kind of answer uh, another question we had there from Carmelita, which was, um, are builders pushing the price up and excluding the 180 to 200 market? I, I did make out what you said there, Lawrence, that you said that there's a builder up in Conroe that has more in the 120 area. Um, are there any other areas that you're seeing that um, that trend with a, you know more affordable new construction? Not quite sure that he can hear me there. While we wait to reestablish the connection here, oh, there we are. Really close to uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Now I'm hearing you. All right, there we go. You were cutting out for a little bit there and our video is just a little choppy. Um, we're working through it because we know we have good information to share. <laughs> so um, it, it, the question was just, you know, kind of what you were talking about with the new builder and, uh, oh, we lost him completely. I'm sure he'll rejoin here in just a moment. Um, while we are waiting, I do want to mention just a couple things. Um, most of you know that they've now opened vaccinations for any adult in Texas. We actually have a list of resources. If you go to har.com slash vaccine, you can take a look at a list of resources. We have um, signups for every area, every part of town, um, diff different uh retailers that are offering vaccine appointments. So you can definitely go check that out. Um, and hopefully we'll get Lawrence back here in just a moment, but um, jumping ahead just to let you know about next week, we are gonna be welcoming back another returning guest, which is Patrick Jankowski. He's the Senior Vice President of uh, Research at the Greater Houston Partnership. Some of you have seen him on our program before. He uh, always gives us an economic update and some of you may be even getting his newsletter every month. He's, he has the Economy at a Glance newsletter that he sends out. Um, and we're going to be talking about some of those updated numbers. You know, last time we were, he was on this program, he had, uh, we were 
thinking there was going to be a recession. Now we're here. So we're going to get an update on the economy and what to expect in Houston. And I see Lawrence Dean is rejoining us here. And there he is. Hey, shall we try again? Let's keep trying. Yes. So if we could just pick right back up where we uh, had left off, you mentioned the um, new builder in Conroe area around the 120s. Uh, are there any other options around town like that? Certainly, we are seeing uh, more affordable housing, maybe not quite to that uh, affordable price point, but definitely well under 200 and even below 180, 190 uh, in multiple parts of the city. Uh, we're seeing uh, increasingly uh, affordable new homes being built uh, closer into the city on the northeast side, kind of in the uh, West Little York and North Wayside Drive corridor. There's three active new home subdivisions. Uh, also seeing uh, more affordably priced 150, 160, 170 uh, type pricing of new homes uh, being built out in the uh, 290 uh, and well, really the I-10 West corridor north of I-10 uh, out into uh, beginning to get into to Waller County. Uh, we're also seeing quite a bit of affordably priced housing being built really throughout the northeast part of the, uh, the Houston region, up into New Caney, uh, up into Splendora. Uh, many different locations where uh, in some of these cases they may be geographically a little further out than uh, where new housing was being built previously, but they are you know, nice quality communities in which builders were able to offer homes priced well under 200000 which is increasingly difficult these days. Absolutely. And some of our members are shocked in the comments are saying 120,000. <laughs> so yes, that's, those are good options to look for um, for your uh, clients. There was a question about, and backing up a little bit, um, Lisa made a comment that a friend of hers in the lumber industry said the price is going up about seven and a half percent per week. Um, and another member did ask, Rosie asked, um, can you, do you know why lumber has skyrocketed so much? Sure, uh, the initial uh, cause, and I have to assume that it's still the, the large cause presently was there was all of a sudden, a greatly unexpected demand for lumber, plywood, wood materials right after the pandemic began from a variety of sources that you wouldn't expect. I mean, just think about it. Suddenly, overnight, every restaurant you go to, every coffee shop you go to, every you know, bar or nightclub, uh, I don't know if you really even go to those anymore, but uh, you know what I mean, suddenly had to build wood partitions. Uh, so did churches. So did all these other uh, types of public uh, places. And so mm -hmm. suddenly overnight, there was this demand that no one in the lumber industry could have planned for, uh, for their product. And that happened simultaneously almost with, or maybe 45 or 60 days behind, suddenly everybody wanting a new house, which you know, <laughs> we had at Zonda, one of the, the many responsibilities we have is forecasting housing demand for the next couple of years. And so we had, you know, for Houston, you know, before the pandemic began, we had forecast that 2020 would be a year that we saw about the same number of homes started that we, new homes started that we saw in 2018 and 2019. Both of those years were very uh, consistent, seeing around 29 to 30,000 starts. We didn't forecast that there'd be a 21% increase mm -hmm. at the same time that all of these other users would be needing lumber and at the same time that uh, all of us were stuck at our homes and finally doing all of the home improvement projects that we had been waiting five years to get around to. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of little incremental uh, things that put them together and wow, we don't have enough lumber. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Richard asked if there's, has the use of manufactured homes increased? Have you, I don't know if you guys measure that, but have you, do you know anything about the manufactured? Uh, so we don't measure it. And so since we don't measure it, I can't really tell you if it's increased or decreased, but I will say that uh, that is uh, still a you know, meaningful piece of activity uh, in the Houston area, especially in the further exurban locations. Uh, there's a, a pretty steady business in uh, selling lots to individuals that uh, can then uh, put a manufactured home uh, on them. And and that is, that's another one of the tools in the toolbox uh, that's being used to supply that badly needed affordable housing. 
Okay, very good. Um, there, I see a lot of uh, members asking questions about different parts of town, um, and I want to get into some of the parts of town that are that are seeing the most growth and what you think may be the next up and coming suburbs. But before we do, what price ranges do you think are seeing the most success right now? Certainly. So, uh, slight history lesson over the last you know ten or eleven months. Uh, housing, like everything, really took a 60 to 45 day pause uh, end of uh, March last year and into April. And then starting in about May, June, July of last year, our builders were reporting that uh, largely due to low interest rates, that first time buyers uh, were coming back to the market in a huge amount. Uh, and so uh, the different building programs that served first time home buyers were doing very well. And that, that was kind of the theme throughout the summer, I would say. But then really starting into the fall of last year, and uh, this is still the, the, the situation presently today, uh, demand for new homes is really hitting at across all price points and all buyer profiles. Move up home buyers that may have already purchased their first or maybe even their second home, but now want a bigger home, uh, especially because we're all spending so much more time at home. <laughs> They're buying houses uh, yeah, as, as in, in huge numbers. First time buyers are still buying houses in huge numbers. Luxury buyers, kind of that, that you know, people that are buying their, their last and nicest uh, home, they've come back to the market in uh, large numbers because interest rates are so low and they feel like this is a fantastic time for them to sell their existing home. And then finally, uh, age restricted, you know, in, in Houston, in the Houston area, we have a few Del Webb and Bonterra communities that uh, you have to be, I guess, 55 years uh, old or older, which that used to sound really old, and, and unfortunately, it doesn't sound <laughs> that old anymore. But uh, it's right to, around to the buy corner. a home in, <laughs> truly, truly, uh, you know, those communities and that type of product uh, really did see a great slowdown uh, of buyer demand for you know a longer period of time than the other biotype oriented products, uh, just because that is always a discretionary purchase uh, that person already you know, always has a place to live and uh, from a pure health standpoint public health standpoint uh, that older buyer was the one that was the you know, maybe least interested in going out and exposing themselves in a model home park to look at uh, buying a new home but I say all that to say that even over the last five six months even that has come back uh, uh, very aggressively uh, demand for age-restricted housing. So really, I know that's a bit of a cop-out answer, but at this point in time, the housing market's doing so well that it's it's really kind of firing across uh, all cylinders. That said, uh, the, the strength of this market and the meat of this market is still first-time buyer and first-time move up. Uh, we consistently see, and it's still the case right now, that 84, 80 to 84% of new home starts in a given year, uh, and definitely right now, are of homes base price 399000 and below. Uh, and so that's the meat of this market and is, is still uh, expected to continue to be the meat of this market, even though you know, all, uh, all products and all bio profiles are kind of hitting on all cylinders. Okay, very good. Um, I did see a question come in and it was similar to a question that I was going to ask you in just a moment. So I'll ask it now. Where do you see the next emerging markets for the greater Houston area? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question, uh, Christina and Mike. Uh, thank you for that. So, you know, Houston has a has a you know, fifty year history of, of essentially growing further and further out in concentric circles uh, from the the central city, and and at a high level, that's not really expected to change. Uh, where the next kind of emerging markets that we're seeing uh, and already witnessing and expect to continue to witness, you know, I'd point to a couple corridors. One being the two hundred and ninety corridor out into uh, not just Waller Independent School District, but also out into Waller County. There's a tremendous amount of distribution and logistics uh, employers being built in that area along T90 and, and along I-10. And as the path of growth in places like Bridgeland, Fairfield, places like that has pushed further out to you know, really beyond the Grand Parkway, uh, we will very quickly, we, we already have several large scale, high performance kind of suburban uh, master plan community and, and subdivision type neighborhoods out into Waller ISD that was previously uh, more of a, a rural uh, beyond the city, if that makes sense, type of location. And there's many more planned. Uh, Johnson Development and Concourse Development both have 
large communities underway in Wallow ISD south of 290. And uh, I think initial uh, site development, land development construction uh, has begun on the first village or the first phase of Bridgeland that pushes uh, west of the Grand Parkway and out into Wallow ISD. So I think the Wallow ISD into Wallow County uh, area is probably my number one answer to that question. And then my number two answer to that question is uh, really the 59 North Corridor into New Caney, into Splendora. Uh, that's an area that uh, you know, had not seen as much development as maybe some other uh, areas have, and the, the Grand Parkway now connects it much more easily to the woodlands, to the big airport, to other employment nodes. And it's an area that, uh, for a ho host of reasons, builders and developers are able to supply that badly needed affordable housing in uh, within. And so already seeing a significant growth in uh, places like Splendora. Uh, New Caney's kind of been on the radar for, for a little while now, but now Splendora uh, and even beyond uh, are now definitely in, on the radar and, and will even be more so. Wonderful. That's great information. I'm I'm not sure if you have this information. We already you already did talk a little bit about luxury, but uh, Phoebe asked, "What is the what is the future or the forecast for luxury, uh, the luxury market, inner city and suburban?" Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, those are two very different animals: mm -hmm. uh, inner city and and suburban. You know, so inner city. Uh, Seems like there's always a, a level of demand for luxury homes on teardown lots in Bel Air, West University Place, the Memorial Villages, uh, Garden Oaks, Oak Forest, places like that. And uh, throughout this pandemic period, uh, and, and I don't have the, you know, some of this is, uh, is observation more than having the data to support it. Uh, but you know, it, it is, uh, you know, my observation is that that business, luxury teardown homes uh, in inside Beltway 8 or Memorial Drive west of Beltway 8 uh, mm -hmm. has, has remained steady during the pandemic. It hasn't gone down and it hasn't uh, really gone up either. Uh, mm -hmm. And so steady is, is in a lot of ways winning the race. Mm -hmm. uh, the suburban piece of that, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, demand for luxury suburban homes in Houston, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, dovetails directly with the health of the energy industry. And while things are improving in the energy industry, you know, for most of this past 10, 11, 12 months, things have not been great in uh, oil and gas. And so the demand that we're seeing for suburban luxury homes is much more, I guess I would say, organic in nature and sustainable. It's not a, you know, in 2013, 14, we saw a big uptick in demand for suburban luxury homes because, hey, oil was priced $100 a barrel. And so we had a lot of people that you know, suddenly could afford that house that couldn't have three years ago. That's not what the you know relatively strong demand that we've seen for luxury housing in the suburbs is right now. It's built on a little more of a, a solid foundation, low interest rates, uh, organic demand, things of that nature. Uh, so I don't know if that exactly answers uh, your question, Phoebe, but uh, you know, all in all, the luxury market is a piece of our market and it's, it's doing well. Okay, great, that's very helpful. Um, we've, we've alluded to this a little bit already, but it seems like a good number of companies are continuing to allow employees to work from home or maybe some sort of hybrid. Um, how do you think this will impact office space? Now, that's a great question. That's a question that is uh, on everybody's mind, in the, especially if you're in the office space business. Mm -hmm. it, my, my observation, I uh, don't know that I'm going to be right on this, but my observation is that this will continue a trend that had already been moving forward prior to COVID around just good companies really reducing the square footage of office space that they need. Moving from, you know, over the years, it's moved from a setting where you know, everybody got their own office or most people got their own office to then everybody except for a few people got cubicles and then it even in the last few years has evolved or devolved depending on how you look at it hmm. uh, to much more of an open office space concept and so large companies have been seeking to uh, reduce their uh, footprint of office space that they're renting already this only you know kind of further uh, expands and or exacerbates that uh, you know will work from home uh, be a forever trend yes most likely to some degree will it uh, 
encompass a hundred percent of employers or employees? You know, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, there will still be lots of organizations that need to have office space and need to have people working together in offices. But you know, net net effect of that, regardless, we'll definitely see fewer uh, office square feet square feet of office space demanded uh, in the future. Okay, um, kind of asking you to again look at your crystal ball and look into the future for us a little bit here. Um, <laughs> but David asked, do you, do you believe July and August will be busier this year, given the usual rush, rush of spring and early summer will leave some consumers unable to buy a home because of the low inventory? Do you see a rush coming in late summer or early fall? So the COVID and work from home and school from home life that we've been living now for, for a year has seemed to uh, like smooth out the seasonality uh, mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, but I would say only a little bit. I would still expect there to be some level of, uh, of crush in July and August because even if uh, children are still on school virtually, which gosh, I hope by next fall semester that's not the case. But if it is, uh, uh, you know, even if they're uh, virtually on school, probably have a, a level of interest in getting them on virtual in the school district and at the school you want them at. So I would expect that there will be some uh, level of rush, maybe just a little bit muted versus normal. Mm -hmm. And our inventory conditions are already uh, amazingly tight. And so it really wouldn't require much of an uptick in interest and demand to you know, get, just as David said, uh, to get to where some consumers are really unable to find a home or at least find the home that uh, fits what they really need and, and uh, makes it worthwhile to make the move. Okay, wonderful. Um, another question that came in from, um, you mentioned a few parts of town. Um, I don't know if you uh, have any data on the Fulcher area. Noel asked, do you have information regarding the growth and sales of Fulcher? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Fulcher is uh, doing very well. Now, if you look at the historic paths of growth in Houston, Fulcher is really just the next leg in that you know, westward growth along Buffalo Bayou that's characterized the history of Houston development for 100 years. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, as Katy South, which is what uh, us in the building industry would call the areas around, you know, Cinco Ranch, Cross Creek Ranch, Firethorn, places like that. So south of I-10, north of the West Park Toll Road, as that area over this housing market cycle has really effectively built out. I mean, it's almost done. There's almost mm -hmm. no place left to build a house. Fulcher is the you know, next immediate ring, uh, and and by and large, it's a place that's that's ready for it. Uh, it's part of Lamar Consolidated ISD, so it's got you know very good schools, including the new well, it's not even a relatively new Fulcher High School. Uh, it's already got some level of of you know restaurants and hospitality infrastructure, and there's you know, already you know several uh, very active communities there, uh, and and several more planned. So. Uh, yeah, I would expect uh, to continue to see pretty strong uh, growth in Fulcher. Fulcher is typically a, kind of a move-up housing market, uh, mm -hmm. but we've seen some really strong success with entry-level product, uh, you know, central communities at Polo Ranch especially, if you can economically provide that uh, sure. in that area. Sure. Um, another question came in from Mike. Um, lumber prices have been a a major factor in costs. Do you feel new construction guidelines for flood and detention will make a significant impact on pricing? Great question there. Yeah, very good question. Uh, prop, yes. Uh, short answer, yes, it, uh, those are likely to have an impact on uh, pricing. I think at this point in time, though, the, the rapid increase of regarding lumber pricing will have more of a direct impact. Uh, construction guidelines around uh, flood and detention uh, requirements have more of a supply constraint impact because more frequently a land developer or a home builder that's going to develop a piece of land for their own use will evaluate a tract of land and now potentially due to the new detention requirements uh, and uh, things of that nature, it simply won't pencil. So you know, those houses won't even get to be built to have prices increase. Uh, mm -hmm. If that makes sense, it will just have a, an impact on, uh, you know, kind of tamping down uh, possible places to build inventory and build new homes. Okay. So we mentioned the work from home and hybrid and how that might affect office space. Are there any other shifts caused by the pandemic that may not change once conditions normalize? 
You know, the work from home and school from home component uh, is uh, definitely the biggest shifts. Uh, and to some degree, both of those uh, may not completely normalize. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, many companies report that they will uh, likely still allow employees some number of days a week to uh, work from home. Uh, and school districts uh, may increasingly offer, uh, you know, continual virtual schooling. Uh, so as a result, the, how that, what that means for homes in the housing market is that uh, we could see, especially in the new home space, builders continue to focus a little bit more on offering more robust work from home lifestyle packages mm -hmm. uh, and seeing that as a uh, you know, possible incentive to, to get people to buy a new home and buy a new home from them if this home has a really great home office solution uh, built in. And so I think we'll see that. And then we'll also see incrementally uh, more sustained demand for new homes and homes in general in places that are further out that might be a place you really want to live but wouldn't be able to do that uh, previously if you knew you had to drive to an office somewhere in Houston uh, five days a week at 7.45 in the morning. Places like Burnham, places like Sealy, Columbus, uh, places like uh, Conroe and Willis mm -hmm. will likely continue to benefit from that. Right. And you also have so many companies that are hiring globally now as well. You know, you can mm -hmm. apply for a, a, a job in Germany, you know, because they'll allow you to work in Houston. So, yeah, that's a, a, some really good points there. Um, I really uh, quickly, because we're, I know we're short on time, actually we're over time here, but uh, I'm going to kind of do a little speed round with locations that have been thrown out. Mitra said, um, do you have any information on I-10 Upper Downtown? Yeah, so I guess we're probably talking about kind of the St. Arnold's Brewery, uh, Fifth <laughs> Ward, that area. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that area as well as Edo and points well beyond Edo uh, are seeing uh, tremendous growth. Uh, the area is kind of along the nat and the Navigation Boulevard corridor out east of downtown and further into the east end, uh, even into, uh, uh, oh gosh, blanking on the neighbor Eastwood and, and some of those neighborhoods, mm -hmm. uh, definitely seeing uh, growth in demand and growth in new housing. And the same is very much true in you know, kind of what you're calling I 10 Upper Downtown, uh, Fifth Ward, and, and uh, those areas. There's a lot of redevelopment and new development uh, occurring in those areas. And, and in, in all the areas I mentioned, it's a little bit of a, a challenge because, on one hand, uh, it's you know, a positive thing to see uh, revitalization and new housing uh, get built and, and new residents find that urban home in Houston that they they wanted. But on the other hand, uh, those none of those areas were all existing, thriving communities in their own way. And, and so it's a challenge to, uh, to mit mitigate and manage around you know, the risks of gentrification and people that have long lived in a neighborhood now not being able to. And so uh, yeah, that's a long answer to a short question. Yes, definitely seeing uh, increased housing and, and support retail, uh, entertainment, et cetera, development up in that uh, north of downtown area. Wonderful. Um, what about Rosenberg? Rosenberg uh, is doing very well. So Richmond and Rosenberg, uh, kind of like, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Waller benefiting, or Waller ISD benefiting from really the build out of points further in, in sci and uh, you know, Bridgeland, Fairfield, places like that, and sci ISD, uh, Richmond Rosenberg, but especially Rosenberg, are benefiting from uh, kind of the effective build out of places like Sugarland. You know, mm -hmm. now that is the closest in place that there is still some land available that a sizable new home subdivision could be uh, developed and built. And so Rosenberg, particularly south of 59, uh, doing very well and seeing more and more new communities either presently opening uh, for sales or uh, in the in the planning stages we're even seeing uh, kind of to that same end we're even seeing multiple new home communities planned that, that should deliver their first lots and new homes within the next year to two years further south of that into pleak and needville and so that area definitely a lot of activity and a lot of strength okay great um so kind of last question here for you lawrence uh, what are your projections for the housing market this year what what do you forecast for the at least the rest of the year yeah, absolutely. Uh, so 
you know, what we focus on from a metric standpoint, especially, is very much new home starts, new home closings. That's kind of a, a, a specialization. And so, you know, we are expecting that uh, when the year of 2021 is up, and we now have all 12 months worth of data available, that we'll actually see a slight decline in annual new home starts first as 2020. Mm-hmm. And that's not an indictment on the market. Uh, still, a, we still expect a, a very strong uh, market throughout the rest of this year. It's completely a factor of supply, and largely that's lot supply. Uh, although uh, those of you all on this call that actually you know, sell and buy new, new and resale homes for a living know that home inventory is extremely tight as well. But but we simply won't have the lot supply uh, available to see another year of growth based on the big almost 37,000 starts we had in 2020. We're expecting to see, yeah, if I had to put a dart, 32 to 34,000 uh, new home starts in uh, 2021, still a great year in housing in Houston, mm-hmm. Texas. That's still, you know, the long-term uh, median and average annual new home starts is 27 to 28,000. So obviously still well above uh, kind of the, the, the norm but we just don't have the uh, available lot supply uh, and the availability operationally to get the houses built to really see growth uh, from the big number we had in 2020, in spite of likely there being demand for that many of the more new homes. Okay, well, wonderful. Lawrence, as always, you've given us so much great information. We were able to just throw areas out at you and you knew exactly what to tell us about those areas. So we really appreciate that. Maybe at some point later this year, if there's new data or early next year, we can have you back to give us an update. Hey, that would be great. It would be my pleasure. Thank you so much, Christina. And thank you, HAO, for having me. Absolutely. Well, uh, that is it for this Member Focus Monday. Um, If you missed it earlier next week, we will be joined by Patrick Jankowski with the Greater Houston Partnership. Um, He is going to give us an economic update, let us know what's coming, what's next for the Houston economy. Um, So we will see you all next Monday at 9 a.m. Have a great week. Bye-bye.